the things he presented yesterday. He dealt with historical anti-Semitism in his first session. Second session yesterday, he dealt with uh, modern anti-Semitism. And in this session, I believe he's dealing with, um, as anti-Semitism brims to the surface in our world, uh, what can we as God's people do about it and how do we respond to it? So Olivier, as you know, is, is an expert in this area. This is his uh, wheelhouse, so to speak. And I hope you have a chance to visit the resource tables and take a look at his materials out there. So at this time, we will call up Olivier Melnick. Good morning. Am I on? OK. A full hour. Wow. I feel special. So um, yeah, the, the resource table uh, is, uh, <clears throat> is uh, I got a few books connected to the, this morning's topic left. So you're going to have to run out and fight over them. But you can, you can find them on my website. You can also find them on Amazon, which is probably the fastest way to get them with free shipping. So. Um, so that, yeah, I want <clears throat> to, excuse me, I might want to get a bottle of water, if you don't mind. That'd be great. Oh, there, I, that, it was already, and I didn't get it. Thank you. Okay. So, yeah, yesterday we looked at historical anti-Semitism, first session. Second session, we look at modern and end times anti-Semitism, and... I've been doing this for over 20 years, and this little booklet that I came up with about, two, about a year ago or so uh, during COVID, uh, after doing 20 years of being the bearer of bad news, I thought it's, it's time. I, mean, I, I would speak on what we can do in different conferences, but I wanted to put this in a little booklet of, you know, the time is now, what can we do? So this is, this is gonna be my, uh, my, my focal point this morning. I'm going to talk about, um, what Christians can do, because we can do something, several things actually. Uh, I touched on a few of those yesterday on second session, but uh, we can do things. And the title of this message is The New Righteous Among the Nations. And some of you are going like, I don't even know what he means by that. Well, we'll go, we'll, we'll go, we'll look at the past, the, um, uh, the group called the Righteous Among the Nations. I'll explain to you who they are. We'll look at the future, and then we'll look at the present. Yeah, I know, it's out of sync, but there's a, there's a reason for that. So before I tell you about the past and the new righteous among the nations, before I tell you what we as Christians can do to help the Jewish community and to make a difference and to hopefully lead them to their Messiah, I want to tell you quickly two stories of what not to do. Okay? First one. <clears throat> the uh, voyage of the St. Louis, uh, a ship from Hamburg, Germany, with 937 passengers. Look at the date. Actually, I was noticing as I was going over my message this morning, uh, two days to the day, 80-some years ago, 83 years ago or so. The St. Louis ship leaves Hamburg, Germany, with 937 passengers, 95% of them Jewish. They had secured their uh, safe passage out of Germany. 1939, the beginning of the war, uh, the, you know, the uh, uh, crystal knot had already happened. Things were not looking too good for the Jewish people. This was still not as bad as towards the end, but this was the time where you could still make a move and get out. So they got on the ship. On May 27, the St. Louis arrives in Cuba with papers to enter Cuba and wait to be from, going from Cuba to the USA to immigrate to the United States. In Cuba, by the time they arrived, I, by the way, I wrote an article on newantisemitism.com. You can read the whole thing if you go to that website. One more thing, don't take notes, remember? I will send you the PDF. Just sign up on the clipboard. Don't take any notes, you'll get all the notes. So they arrive in Cuba. Two weeks later, uh, they had papers that would secure them entry in Cuba, and then at the last minute when they got there, the Cuban government said, no, you can't. We don't want you anymore. 
So they moved up to they moved up the coast, uh, and the next day arrived in the St. Louis arrives in the USA, and the passengers again are denied entry. Stay on the boat. We don't want you. Then they moved further north to Canada, denied entry. So the St. Louis had no choice. It was forced to return to Europe with its passengers who were taken by Great Britain, Netherlands, Belgium, and France. About each of the four countries took about a quarter of the passengers. But at the end of the war, almost a third of the original passengers died in the Holocaust. That's one, one example of what not to do. The other example is even more surprising. Some of you might know about the Lipizzaner horses. I don't know how many of you might know about them. They are beautiful horses that uh, you see a picture of, of the horse here. Uh, they, are, they can be trained to do what no other horse can do in the world. They are very, very calm, very uh, easy to train, beautiful animals. Uh, it's a 450-year-old tradition known as the Lipizzaner Horses Spanish Riding School of Vienna. And uh, actually, it's interesting. When I was a kid, I actually, for a Christmas, I received a huge book from my parents on the story of that school. I was fascinated with the ho those horses. They're incredible horses. And this goes back, way back, I mean, 450 years. Well, the, the rare stallions were, at, uh, stallions were at risk of being killed by 1944 when the Russians are, were moving towards, uh, uh, towards Western Europe and basically they were going to end up as uh, food rations. Those horses would be killed and used for food. Wartime. So a rescue team was led by General Patton and, uh, and was sent to save them. And General Patton was a, a horseman. He loved horses. He loved to ride horses. And so he was sent to... Uh, to the area in Europe, and that's a picture of him right there on one of them. Uh, <clears throat> and uh, what happened is that um, also, at the same time, all throughout 1944, various Jewish organizations begged the USA to bomb the death camps, or at least the railroads leading to them. Nothing happened. There's a connection here. The U.S. War Department responded that this would constitute, and I quote, a diversion of cons considerable air support essential to the success of our forces now engaged in decisive operations elsewhere. Basically, we cannot bomb Auschwitz, all the railroads leading to Auschwitz, because we cannot afford to use our resources for that. It's not going to work. At the same time, German factories were bombed within less than five miles of Auschwitz less than five miles, yet the camp was left untouched. The Allies did not want tens of thousands of Jewish refugees, but a few dozen horses were worth the effort. They were saved. The horses were saved. The Jews died in the camps. Another example of what not to do. Okay? Now, this was the bad news. Let's look at what we can do. I want to talk again about the past, Yad Vashem, the future, the time of Jacob's trouble, and the present, not being a bystander. Now remember, those two stories that I just told you are setting the stage for what, what we should not be doing and what we should not be ignoring, but there's something we can do. So let me explain Yad Vashem. Uh, first of all, I mean, this may me laugh this morning when I look at this because I speak in a lot of places and I always like to tell people this is where I stand. Being here, it's almost like I don't need this, uh, this slide, okay? But just as a reminder, rapture, tribulation, second coming, millennial kingdom, eternal order. Amen? Amen. All right, let's keep moving. <laughs> this is the fastest way I've ever done it on this one. <clears throat> okay. The time of Jacob's trouble, a couple of scriptures to remind us. Uh, Joel 2.1, uh, uh, and two, blow a trumpet in Zion and sound an alarm on my holy mountain. Let all the inhabitants of the land tremble, for the day of the Lord is coming. Surely it is near, a day of darkness and gloom, a day of clouds and thick darkness, as the dawn is spread over the mountains. So there is a great and mighty people. There has never been anything like it, nor will there be again after it through the years of many generations. 
Jacob's trouble, the time of Jacob's trouble is, is another way of describing the seven year great tribulation. S Jeremiah 37, Alice, that day is great, there is none like it, and it is the time of Jacob's distress, but he will be saved from it. Daniel 12, 1, now at that time, Michael, the great prince who stands guard over the sons of your people will arise, and there will be a time of distress which has never occurred since there was a nation until that time, and at that time, your people, everyone who is found written in the book will be rescued. Three possible outcomes for Jewish people who are going to be left behind. Death without Messiah, which is eternity in the lake of fire. Death as a tribulation martyr. I keep forgetting to take the S out of that. Martyrs, that's a typo. I do my best proofing after I hit send. Can you, can you relate to that? Yeah. And survival through the tribulation, direct entrance into the millennial kingdom. And I will be developing that last part and uh, looking at that passage in Matthew 25, 31 through 40. Now, I had a sister yesterday here come to me and say, I really want to make a difference in Jewish ministry, but I'm not sure I am making a difference. I want to do something. I want to reach out to the Jewish people, but they're so hard. You're right. You've heard... The 2,000 years of anti-Semitism and, and, and of this, the, the craziness against the Jews. And it's no surprise that my people don't want to have anything to do with Jesus. After what we've heard. So it's, you know, my people are gospel resistant. But I would like to offer, I would like to propose something. Now, I'm not setting dates here. If I set a date for anything, I'm going to be escorted out and never invited again. So I can't do that. I, I wouldn't do it anyway. But we are, I mean, you, you've heard... You've heard Pastor Andy, and we are really in, in, the, in the final moments of the end times. We know things are just like, you know, it's, it, the, 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 the events and the growth of everything that's happening, it's exponential with greater intensity. So I would like to offer to you that as you speak to Jewish people today, and they're rejecting the message of the gospel, don't stop. Why? Because there's a possibility that you're speaking and planting a seed in the heart and the mind of one of the 144,000. So you are preparing those who are going to be left behind but will become the 144,000 Jewish men who are going to be sealed by God and going to be spreading the gospel during the tribulation and they'll make a big difference. So you could be equipping them and you don't even know it. So don't lose hope. Continue to share the gospel with your Jewish friends. So just, just saying that. So now, <clears throat> let's look at <clears throat> the past. Defining the righteous among the nations. Now, there's the righteous among the nations, and there's the, this other group that I call the new righteous among the nations. The righteous among the nations, Ger uh, Toshav means resident alien, uh, alien and Hasid Umot HaOlam, pious people of the world. Those, those are the words used by Israel to describe the righteous among the nations. And the Talmud, now, before you come back to me and say, Olivier, we, the Talmud is not inspired like our Bible, but the Talmud has a lot of wisdom. You can learn about Jewish history, Jewish religious thought. There's a lot of wisdom in the Talmud, it's just we don't want to put it on equal footing with the Bible. So in the Talmud, uh, it says, whoever destroys a soul from Israel, the scripture considers it as if he destroyed an entire world. And whoever saves a life from Israel, the scripture considers it as it, it is, if save the entire world. I believe this is the inscription, or the, the second part of the inscription, is what was written on the ring that was given to um, uh, Oscar Schindler at the end of his, uh, when he saved the Jewish people. So, we have that. Now, the, uh, uh, again, just wanted to throw that scripture in about you know, compassion and taking care of people. In Luke 10, 33, 34, but the Samaritan who, has on, who was on a journey came upon him, and when he saw him, he felt compassion and came to him and bandaged his wounds, pouring oil and wine on them, and he put him on his own beast and brought him to an inn and took care of him. Uh, I look at this passage and I have another, another message I do when I show the story of my family and I call it, are there still good Samaritans today? Because, you know, the new righteous among the nations, I look at them as being good Samaritans. You'll understand this uh, as we go further. 
So in 1963, there's a picture on the right of a handsome looking guy, um, <laughs> if I say so myself, uh, pointing at a name. Uh, this is the wall of the righteous in uh, the wall of honor at the, uh, at the end of the property at the uh, Yad Vashem Memorial Holocaust Museum in, in Jerusalem. And so Yad Vashem in 1963 um, uh, started to award the honorary title of righteous among the nations to Gentiles who helped Jews during the war. Trees were planted on the premises. So there's a tree for uh, um, Oscar Schindler. There's a tree for uh, Cory Ten Boom. There's, there are trees for, for a lot of people, but they ran out of room after a while. It's not a bad thing when you think about why they were doing it. Uh, so they started this wall by year and by country. And I found this uh, people that you can't read here, but I found that name uh, last time I went in, uh, in 2019. So I pointed to it and it will make sense in a minute. So, um, by the way, this is the highest honor that Israel can bestow upon a, uh, a, a non-Israeli citizen. As a matter of fact, when you become a righteous among the Gentiles, and the day you pass away, you automatically become an honorary citizen of Israel. So, the criteria for being righteous among the nations, you have to be a Gentile. You had to be actively involved in helping Jews avoid deportation. You had to risk your own life and your, your own freedom or life to do that. And you couldn't seek financial gain or conversion. If those four criteria are met, and, and research has to, I mean, it's serious research uh, to find out if the people actually qualify for that because it's a serious uh, uh, title that is bestowed upon people. It's, it's, so there's a lot of research done. If those four criteria are met, then the person is declared as a righteous among the nations, a righteous among the Gentiles. Some famous ones that you might know, uh, Raoul Wallenberg, he was a Swedish diplomat who actually helped Jewish people. Uh, Cory Ten Boom, of course, who doesn't know that name. Oscar Schindler, another name that you might know. Now, Henri and Magna Trocme, you might not know. They are the pastor a couple, a pastor and his wife in the center of France of a small village known as Le Chambon sur Lignon. And that little village, I love that story, they, they, they saved about 3,000, minimum 3,000 Jewish people, mostly kids. They would be brought to them uh, throughout the war and they would hide them and they would say, just keep them safe for, for the time of, you know, as long as, you know, until they maybe send them to a different country. But the way they did it is the kids would come usually in the middle of the night and the pastor would call his church together the next day and say, I received seven Old Testaments. Who would like to take one? Who needs an Old Testament? Speaking in code. And somebody says, I'll take two. I'll take one. And that way, the kids would be put in villages around that, that small village uh, in the same vicinity, and they would keep them safe throughout the war under the nose of the Nazis. So that's Henri and Magda Trocme. There's one more couple I want to introduce to you. It's this couple, Pierre and Ida Darico. They received the title posthumously uh, in 2013. And um, they, Pierre and Ida Darico, rescued Evelyn Weinzweig from the Nazis and hid her on their farm in the southwest of France from 42 to 45. She was hiding as a Catholic girl. And since you've already been here yesterday, you already know that Evelyn was my mother. So I wouldn't be here today if it was not for those righteous among the nations saving my mother from the Nazis after her dad was taken to the, to, by the Gestapo to, to go to Auschwitz. And here she is uh, on uh, both sides of her are the two brothers that used to be about 12 years old when she, uh, when she uh, met them on the farm and they're receiving this medal of the Yad Vashem on behalf of their parents from uh, this gentleman on the right side who came from Israel to uh, give them the, um, the medal. And um, they reunited, my mother and uh, those two brothers reunited after 70 years. And I was moving up north to Washington State with my wife uh, in, uh, around that time when my nephew sends me this link to this TV uh, 
show like 20, 20 or 60 minutes in France. My mom said, I called her, she said, I'm going to be on TV. I'm going to the south of France to meet the two brothers. I'm excited. I'm going to be on TV. I'm going like, yeah, sure. Like local TV or somebody with a look. It ended up being like a 2020 show, the, the French version. And, and then so I get this thing and I'm in, in, in a, spending a night in a hotel on the way to Washington State. And I click on the link and I watch the whole 30 minutes about how oh, this woman was saved by this family. I'm just, I'm bawling. I'm going, this is my mom. This is incredible. And uh, so I ended up taking nine minutes of it and put subtitles. It is on my YouTube channel just for that. You should all subscribe. And I know who doesn't. Okay. So, so uh, but anyway, it's a great, great story. At the beginning, my mother comes, on the, uh, by, comes off the train and the two brothers are waiting for her and they see her and they recognize her. And then she comes to them. And my mother was about that tall. She was not that very, she's not big. And she comes to them and she goes, and the, the, the family name is Darico, and she goes, Monsieur Darico, and he goes, yes, and she looks at them with those big eyes, and she goes, I'm alive because of you. I was, I mean, how can you not cry? I mean, it was, it, it was so emotional. So that's uh, that's just one more example of the righteous among the nations. Yad Vashem established that the righteous among the nations helps helped in several ways, provided shelter and food made or provided false papers, moved Jewish people away from dangerous Nazi-controlled areas, and saved Jewish children who had lost their parents in the camps. And other things, but those were the big, the big areas where they really made a difference. As of January 1, 2021, Yad Vashem had recognized almost 28,000 righteous among the nations around the world, accounting for about 10,000 rescuing stories. Over 22,000 of these individuals individuals come from five countries uh, which when I found out in my research I was quite surprised to be honest with you that the largest number of rescues came out of Poland because also <laughs> the largest number of Jews came out of Poland but not the same way they came out on the trains and they died I mean a lot 95% of the Jews of Poland died in the Holocaust 95% so Poland Netherlands France, Ukraine, and Belgium. That's 22,000 of the, uh, of the uh, righteous among the nations. And, uh, and they still find them because when I preached that message about six months ago, I used to tell people, there's only two from the USA. It's better than nothing, right? I checked this morning, friends. We're up to five. This is, no, I mean, they're still working at finding the people that helped the Jews during the war. It's a, it's a, it's a big job. And I think it's very important. So, now, who are the new righteous among the nations? Well, they are a group of Gentiles coming in the future. Not in UFOs, okay? They will be identified by Yeshua upon a second coming after the tribulation, at the end of the tribulation. They are sp spoken of in the Olivet Discourse in Matthew 25, 31 through 46, and we'll look at that in detail in a minute. They're never called righteous among the nations in the Bible. They are called righteous by Messiah himself. We'll see that, but not righteous among the nations. So let's look at the future, the role of the new righteous among the nations. If you have your Bible, you can open it to uh, Matthew 25, starting with verse 31. So there is, a, um, there is a judgment at the beginning. We see when, uh, at the time that we read this, when the Son of Man, that's Yeshua, comes in His glory and all the angels with Him, He will sit on His glorious throne. So that, that's Yeshua, uh, second coming at the end of the seven-year tribulation. And there is immediately after He comes, the first thing He does, and He separates two groups of people that are called in that passage the goats and the sheep. So there's a separation in verse 32 and 33. All the nations will be gathered before him and he will separate them from one another as the shepherd separates the sheep from the goats. And he will put the sheep on his right and the goats on the left. Two different groups. There's a reward. Verse 34. The reward is no small potato, okay? Then the king will say to those on his right, Come, you who are blessed of my Father, inherit the kingdom prepared for you from the foundation of the world. So those who are the sheep 
on his right, get immediate entrance into the Messianic kingdom. Wow, what have they done to deserve such a thing? Well, keep reading. The reason, compassion. Verse 35 and 36. For I was hungry, and you gave me something to eat, and I was thirsty, and you gave me something to drink. I was a stranger, and you invited me in, naked, and you clothed me. I was sick, and you visited me. I was in prison, and you came to me. Then the righteous, then there's a reaction from the, uh, from the righteous. They're surprised. They say, well, well, wait a minute. I mean, as Yeshua is telling them all this, the righteous will answer them, Lord, when did we see you hungry and feed you, or thirsty and give you something to drink? And when did we see you a stranger and invite you in? Or naked and clothe you? When did we see you sick or in prison or, or, or come to you? They, they, they're, they're puzzled. They go like, I don't know. What are you talking about? The response is an amazing response. The king will answer and say to them, Truly I say to you, to the extent that you did it to one of these brothers of mine, even the least of them, you did it to me. Wow. They helped Jewish people during the tribulation at the expense of their own lives, danger, risk, expensive, whatever they did. That's going to come in the future. We don't know exactly how they're going to happen, but that's going to happen in the future. And the result is Yeshua looks at them because you did, this to, you, the, you did it to them. It's like you did it to me. Wow. Well, what, happened to the, what happens to the other group? I'm glad you asked. Different reward. That one is not direct entrance in the kingdom. It's direct entrance into the lake of fire. Then he will also say to those on his left, Depart from me, accursed ones, into the eternal fire, which has been prepared for the devil and his angels. For I was hungry, and you gave me nothing to eat. I was thirsty, and you gave me nothing to drink. I was a stranger, and you did not invite me in. Naked, and you did not clothe me. Sick and in prison. You, will, you, you did not visit me. Then they themselves also will answer, Lord, when did we see you hungry, thirsty, a stranger, naked, sick, in prison, and did not take care of you? Then he will answer them, Truly I say to you, to the extent that you did not do it to one of the least of these, you did not do it to me. These will go away into eternal punishment, but the righteous into eternal life, the sheep and the goats. And you notice it says eternal punishment, not destruction, not end of life. Eternal punishment. The lake of fire is a real place. It is not the end of life, the end of existence. We don't cease to exist. We have eternal life the moment we're created. The moment we're created, we just choose our destination. Choose wisely. So there's two choices here. So let's keep going. I want to make something clear. This is not salvation by works. Some people say, well, wait a minute. They did it and they get saved because you know, you know, Yeshua is, is rewarding them because of, of what they did. Because, so it's salvation by works. And no, it's not. It's kingdom entry, not because of performance, but it's performance as a result of salvation. These Gentiles somehow became believers during the tribulation. Maybe through the work of the 144,000, but that's not the only people who will uh, share the gospel during the tribulation. But somehow these Gentiles became believers and they understood the place of Israel, the place of the Jewish people, and how the Jewish people were being persecuted and they wanted to really make a difference above and beyond what they could do to help Jewish people during that time. So this is performance as a result uh, being grateful for what God did in their life and saved them. And let me, let me put it this way. This is not, this is not going to be a shocker to you, but the tribulation, at least the second half, this is no picnic, okay? This, this is going to be, all, there's going to be a lot of death, a lot. As a matter of fact, two-thirds of the Jewish people will die during the tribulation. If you don't believe me, check uh, Zechariah 13, 8 and 9. And this is a verse that I have struggled with my whole life when, uh, when I read it. It says that two-thirds of the people will, uh, will die and one th will perish and one-third will be refined as gold is refined and as silver is refined. And that one-third is the one-third that will survive the tribulation and that will become the Israel of God. 
the, 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 the corporate Israel, that all Israel will be saved. We talked about that yesterday. The reason why I'm bringing this up is because this verse always bothered me when I got to read it. And I remember about a couple of years ago, I was reading it again. And I ended up discussing it with a great theologian, Ellen Melnick. That's my wife. <laughs> and you'll, you'll agree with me in a minute. And I said, Ellen, I don't like this. It's worse than the Holocaust. Today, we have 15 million, about 15 million Jews in the world. If, that's, if, if we were in a tribulation, we're not, and we're not going to be, I understand that. But if it was, by today's numbers, 10 million Jews would die. Because it's, you know, we can't, again, I said it yesterday, I'll, I'll say it again today. You can't cancel verses. If they're there, they're there. And, you know, they mean what they mean. So two-thirds of my people, that, that, that's 10 million. And she goes, chill, Olivier. Read it again. I read it again. I said, okay, I read it again. So what? And she looked at me and she goes, you know, when God wants to give you numbers, he's really, really precise. The 12 tribes, the 40 days, the, 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 uh, the six days of creation, all the numbers about the, the battles in, 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 you know, in Joshua and all those, you know, the armies and, and the 144,000 and the, the, all those numbers, precise numbers. And I said, so I still didn't get it. I was like, so what? She goes, he gave you a percentage. So the percentage is never going to change. It's always going to be two-third and one-third because that's what the Bible says. It's the truth. But the number within that percentage can reduce. It doesn't have to be 10 million and 5 million. It can reduce. How do we reduce it? By leading Jewish people to their Messiah before the rapture. Amen? Amen? It's simple. So, so this, is, this is the point here. So, by the way, you agree with me now, the great theologian, Ellen Melnick? Yeah, yeah. She's not here today, but she'll, uh, she'll appreciate that. I'll tell her. So, we know about the return of anti-Semitism. Obviously, I've spoken on that yesterday, and, and including the, the Q&A session. The whole world will turn on Israel. Zechariah 12, 3, we know that. Anti-Semitism is on a continuum. It's never stopped, okay? We thought it stopped for about 20 years after the war, but it, it really was swept under the carpet. It was taboo to talk about it. And people thought, uh, for two reasons, actually, in the world, people thought that anti-Semitism had, had, had come to an end. Uh, when they caught uh, Adolf Eichmann in South America, they thought, oh, this is, this is a good thing. This, you know. And the other thing that people thought anti-Semitism was over with is in 1965, uh, there was this thing called, uh, I don't know how to say it in, in Latin, Nostra Etata, Etate, or uh, it's, the, uh, it's something that came out of the, um, uh, the Catholic Church when this statement was made by the Pope that it's time to admit that the Jews are no longer responsible for killing Christ. 1965. What took you so long? Yeah. And by the way, this hasn't stopped the animosity Jewish people to this day get from the Catholic Church. But 1965, officially, you know, ex-cathedra, officially, the, the church said, we don't hold the Jews responsible for the killing of Christ. Well, thank you so much. Okay? Uh, so that and the catching of Adolf Eichmann, uh, people thought, you know, this is, this is looking better. Anti-Semitism is, is dead. It died after the Holocaust. Well, it didn't. It came back full force. Because... Again, behind anti-Semitism is the enemy of God, Satan, who is going to do whatever he can to kill the Jews. So we know it's, it's been on a continuum, thick and thin, but never interrupted. Jews are being killed again. You already have that information from yesterday. Uh, I like what Melanie Phillips, if you don't know who Melanie Phillips is, she's a British commentator, she's a very conservative, I don't believe she's a, she's a believer, but she really understands Israel, and, and she's a conservative commentator, uh, I, I like what she, uh, what she does, and she calls it a transnational neo-pogrom. Pogrom is the word for the riots that came out of Eastern Europe during uh, the mid-1800 to the 1900, where my great-grandmother came out of the pogroms. Fiddler on the Roof story, that's the pogroms. So she calls this new anti-Semitism a transnational, universal, neo-new pogrom. 
Satan is obsessed with eliminating the Jews. I've said that many times. And he knows that one day Israel will say, Baruch haba Bashem Adonai, and that will put a stop to his agenda. So, the time is now. Friends, let me introduce you to the new righteous among the nations. You're here. This is you. What do I mean by that? What will take place, I, okay, you're going like, wait a minute, is he saying we're going to be going through the tribulations? I don't like this message. No, 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 no. I'm saying that the model of what's going to happen in the tribulation, there's no reason why we couldn't do it today. You are saved by the grace of God. You love the Jewish people. You love Israel. It's obvious. So I'm telling you, my people haven't seen the worst yet. It's going to get worse for the Jewish people. Not too long ago, I was in Colleyville uh, reporting on that uh, hostage situation for the ministry. I mean, it was an hour away from where I, where I live in Texas. I was, I was shocked. It's, it, it's going to keep happening. So my people need the new righteous among the Gentiles. The time is now. Evangelicals love and pray for Israel and their Jewish friends. And that's, you know, pray for the peace of Jerusalem. May they prosper, love you. That's wonderful. But I've, seen th I've been saying this for a few years now. Praying for the Jewish people and praying for Israel is great. Don't stop. But that is just a foundation. have got to start building the house now. Because time is, the time is now and it's not going to get easier. Why not start helping Jewish people today? And I'm, let me give you some examples. Jewish people need to hear that we have their back, that you have their back. But you look at me, you go like, how do I do that? You have a lot of good questions. <laughs> it's time to put our faith into action. And by the way, if you are part of the new righteous among the nations, and I believe you are, then you're basically just doing Genesis 12, 3 in action. You will bless those, I will bless those who bless you, I'll curse him who curses you. Genesis 12, 3 in action is exactly that. Because how can you possibly, what's the best way to bless the Jewish people? I mean, helping them, you know, uh, whatever is going to be needed between now and the rapture, and there's many things we can do. But if we don't do all this because of the gospel, then, then, we're doing it wrong. There are plenty of organizations, and I've got some names, I'll tell you in private if you're interested, who take Christian money to do humanitarian work. They help the Jews, and that's great. But it's just humanitarian work. Humanitarian work is helping, sending them to Israel, giving food, giving uh, 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 medication, uh, helping them with, with lodging, but never saying one word about the gospel. And friends, when you hug a Jew saying, I love you and I want to help you, and you never said anything about Jesus, it's like hugging them all the way into the lake of fire. So don't tell me you love the Jews if you don't share the gospel. You have to share the gospel. We have to, whatever we do to help our Jewish friends, it is because we want to build a relationship. We want to do it because we love them. And we want to do it because we want to have a chance to share the gospel, the gift that never stops giving. We will not be bystanders. Visit a synagogue, a Jewish community center, a Jewish organization, and let them know that you are not a bystander. Call Jewish officials and let them know you're not a bystander. Email Jewish officials. You can call, you can email, you can get a hold of them on, on the social network. They need to know that as a Christian, you've got their back. Reassure your Jewish friends that they can count on you. When you hear something in the community, when you hear like Colleyville or a, a Jewish community center, there was a, a graffiti or they went to a synagogue and they... they you know, firebomb the synagogue and a Torah scroll was burned or, or defaced the, the walls of the synagogue or, or uh, 
painted swastikas on, on, on Jewish tombstone. I mean, this is, believe me, you probably don't get a lot of this on the news. I get stuff on, like this every single day. It used to be weekly. It's daily now. I, I just have to sift through all of it and decide which one am I going to make a comment or say something about or do something. It is so much. So when you see things like this, call that place. Call the synagogue, call the Jewish Community Center and say, hey, I, I, my name is so-and-so. I'm a Christian. I love Israel. I love the Jewish people. And I want you to know if there's anything I can do, just call it. Let me know. I've got your back. Another way that churches can make a difference is any church that has, if, I don't know if there's pastors or pastors listening online or uh, any church that has a marquee. It doesn't really take much once in a while to put something on the marquee, something like, we wish our Jewish friends happy Hanukkah. We wish our Jewish community happy Passover. This is like rebuilding bridges. It's easy to do. Just make sure you don't wish your Jewish friends happy Yom Kippur. That's, Yom Kippur is a solemn day where you don't wish anybody happy Yom Kippur. Just, just trust me on that. <clears throat> but that's an easy one to do. Or if something happens in a Jewish community, I think it would be great if churches would put on their marquee, we stand in solidarity with the community of Colleyville, the Jewish community. I'm using Colleyville because we're in Texas. But, I mean, there will be other opportunities. But we've got to go beyond that. We've got to go beyond that. Because... Um, like I said, Jewish people need to know that they can trust Christians. Believe me, now you know. And I said this this morning without the two sessions yesterday. You'd go like, well, they can trust me. They can. But now you know why my people really, by default, don't trust Christians. Because of the 2,000 years of history that you've heard about. That most of you had never heard before. So they need to know that they can trust Christians. Now this uh, uh, quote by uh, Elie Wiesel who was the, uh, the, the, the spokesperson for the Holocaust. He, uh, his dad died in his arms in auschwitz birkenau when he was 15 or 16, and he survived, and he, has, you know, he wrote several books. By the way, there's one book he wrote that I recommend every Christian should read. It's called Night. It's not that big. It's a small uh, handbook. Uh, it, you, it's, it's a quick read, but it will change your life. It, it will impact you in ways that you never knew you could be impacted. Read night. Um, we must take sides. Neutrality helps the oppressor, never the victim. Silence encourages the tormentor, never the tormented. That's what he said. A bystander who does nothing always facilitates the work of a perpetrator. So don't tell me, I just don't want to take sides. I just... I, I, I don't want to do anything. My mother, when the Gestapo came to get my grandfather in the house, she was 15, they came, they knock on the door, and my grandfather was hiding in the cellar of the house. They said, we know that your husband, to my grandmother, we know that your husband is hiding in the house, in the building somewhere. He needs to come with us. We have questions for him. My grandfather was in 1942. My grandfather was from Russia. He was legally in France, but he didn't have the proper papers yet. They were in the process. And of course, 1942 was not a good time to look for immigration paper as a Jew in France. It, it was kind of slow. It didn't work very well. So he was hiding. And she told the Nazis, um, well, my grandmother said, I don't know where he is. She lied. I, I don't know where he is. Uh, he left. Uh, I, I can't contact him. And they told her, well, come back tomorrow, and if he doesn't show up to go with us, we'll take you and your daughter, Evelyn. So they left. She signaled him. He came back upstairs, and she told him what happened, and they said, they're going to come back tomorrow. He said, well, that, don't worry about it. I'm not going to let that happen. I will get a few belongings, I will go find a safe place for our family, I'll signal to you when it's safe for you to come meet me wherever I'm going. And she said, well, that's great, but tomorrow if they come back and you're not here, they'll take me and Evelyn. And he said, well, that's not going to happen. 
I can't do that to you. I'll go with them tomorrow. Don't worry, I'll be back. Next morning they came. They took him. He never came back. He died actually in Auschwitz. I believe, according to my research, he died pretty quickly. I think he might have not even made it to the camp because he died in seven days. So he, he was sent to a stadium known, known as the, uh, the Ville Div in Paris, and he was kept there you know, with the different, uh, uh, different Jews from different places in France, and then he was put on a train. And I think he might have either died on the train, which the conditions were horrendous, on those uh, you know, animal uh, uh, cars, or he might have died at the selection when they got to Auschwitz. So he didn't, it didn't last very long, which, you know, I, I, recently I saw a Holocaust survivor say something, you know, asking, uh, uh, you know, uh, the interviewer said, were you afraid of death in the camps? And she answered, it just, every time I even think of it, she goes, no, we were afraid of life. Wow. Wow. They were not afraid of death. In the building where my grandfather was hiding, where I lived my whole life, it's like a U-shape, three buildings uh, and a courtyard. Across the courtyard for where, my, where my grandfather and my, my family lived was a family. The daughter of that family was very good friend with my teenage mother at the time. And then to this day, I'm very good friend with their son, the son of you know, the, the next generation. We were about the same age. And we, we stay in touch. And they still, they live there in that same house. That family would end up as a righteous among the Gentiles because they would have done anything to help the ones of my family, my, my grandparents, because they love the Jewish people. They were just across the courtyard. The rest of the building, upstairs from my parents, was a man that I actually met when I was a little tyke who had me sit on his lap. He worked for the French police, which means probably had connections with the, with the militia the, uh, the, that worked for the Germans, you know, the, the Vichy government. He called the Gestapo. He said, there's a Jew in the building. The reason why he called the Gestapo was because he thought he, he was secretly in love with my grandmother. And he thought, if I get rid of the husband, I can snatch the wife. It didn't work quite well for him. The rest of the building... That family who would have done anything for my family and the one that actually gave away my grandfather to the Gestapo, to his death. The rest of the building, there were people behind their shutters doing nothing. And that's about 20 families. They were the bystanders. For whatever reason, they didn't lift a finger. They could have. They didn't do anything. Let's not repeat the mistakes of 80 years ago. We cannot afford to be bystanders. So, and I want to finish with this. If your Jewish friend comes in the middle of the night one day and say, friend, I, I can't go home, it's not safe. I can't use my car. They seized my, they, 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 they froze my account. I don't know where to go. But I know you said, you always said that you love Israel, you love the Jewish people. I thought of you, like three in the morning, in the middle of the night. Are you going to open the door and say, I'm glad you told me this, I'll pray for the peace of Jerusalem? Or are you going to take him in and do whatever it takes to protect them? The choice is ours. But I'm telling you, friends, it's coming. So be ready. We cannot be bystanders. I will not be a bystander. What about you? Let me pray. Heavenly Father, for some reason, 22 years ago, you put me on this journey to fight anti-Semitism. Lord, if I had known where I would be today, I'm not sure I would have wanted to do this. It is hard. It's really hard. Because, because of your word, I know what's coming. But because of your word, I also know that there is hope. I know that we can make a difference. And that, that warms my heart. So Lord, give us the courage. 
Give us the boldness and give us the opportunities. I'm sure there will not, uh, there will be plenty of opportunities. Lord, give us, give us the courage to, to speak up and to defend our Jewish friends for such a time as this. Lord, we know the time is now. Help us not be bystanders. In Yeshua's name, amen. Thank you. Wow, I think that had to be one of the most uh, convicting messages we've ever had here. Amen. Well, we're going to reconvene at 11 a.m., so enjoy your 25-minute break, and we'll see you then.